PFC Stuart Simonson, United States Army, Vietnam. Stuart's one of the 10 veterans I interviewed in Algona, Iowa back in 2007. It was August 13th, August 10th, August 13th in that time frame. Stu was one of the Vietnam veterans that were there. I interviewed some Korean War veterans and World War II veterans, but another great story, folks, from Vietnam. Um, Stu was drafted in February of 69, went to Vietnam, was with Alpha Company, 1st of the 508th, 3rd Brigade, 82nd Airborne. He actually served as a, an infantryman, 11 Bravo, and as a radio operator, too, and also served with the 25th Division in Vietnam. So. Quite a man, quite a story. I want to thank Samuel Thompson. He's a Vietnam veteran. Two tours, 18 months in Vietnam. Samuel, look in this camera. I salute you. Thank you for your service to our country, making it possible for others to hear Stuart Simonson's story. As a fellow brother, welcome home, Samuel. And again, thank you for your support of my work and your patriotism, your service to our country. We will not forget. We will remember. So thank you. If you'd like to sponsor a story, folks, there's information in the video description on my website, LarryCapetto.com click on sponsor a vet or you can choose to donate to my work in the comment section of this video all of the above would be greatly appreciated and I thank you for your support of what I'm doing here getting these stories out so others can hear and listen to them this this channel's doing well becoming more popular like I said I don't monetize my videos so that's not the purpose of it but I need help getting the stories out and people like Samuel have helped me do it so I'd encourage you to become a sponsor it's a good, a good feeling it's a great project something worth well worth the effort if the cause is great enough it's worth the effort so folks subscribe to the channel share the videos let's keep this thing going and uh, I just am grateful. My heart's full today. I thank God for this opportunity to share these stories with you. God bless you. Uh, what year did you, were you drafted, were you enlisted, or what, how'd you get in the Army? Actually, uh, I, had a, I had a brother that was killed in the service in November of 1968. And uh, I was going to college, I was just out of high school going to college. And after that I was kind of floundering, so uh, I went to our draft board and I just said, uh, I asked him where my name was on the list, and they said, well, you're about here. I said, about how long? He says, well, it all depends on who we, somebody might enlist, and it depends what our quota is. And I just said, well, why don't you take it from, from where it is and put it at the top? And so I, I actually was drafted. I just sped up the process. Okay, so, that was what year now? Uh, February of 1969. Okay, and your brother was killed in Vietnam? Or? No, he was actually killed stateside in a training accident. Okay, okay. How old was he at that time? He was 18. So did you, did you have other brothers or is that just him? Oh, I, uh, yes, I'm from a large family. Okay. There was five boys and two girls. Military history in your family then? Or? Uh, uncles and aunts, but not my dad, no. Did you feel a sense of duty to serve your country though, I mean, at that time with Vietnam oh. going on? And uh, yes, and, and probably a, a personal vendetta, maybe get some revenge, uh, if that makes any sense. Uh, maybe do what he wasn't able to do. Where'd you go to basic training? Uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. And you were living in Iowa at the time before that? Yes. So was this your first time away from home really then? Or? Yes. Did you get homesick at all or were you ready to see the world or what? 
I, I, I wouldn't say that I got homesick. I missed home, but uh, uh, I'm pretty adaptable and uh, get along with people pretty well. And so, what was your thoughts about Vietnam at that time? Were you was it evident you were going to go there once you got in the military? Well, you know, uh, I went to West Bend High School, and our history teacher did an incredible job of preparing us for that possibility. Uh, in our uh, American history class, we would spend five to ten minutes uh, at every class period going, uh, going uh, over what was happening in Vietnam, him knowing that very likely uh, a bunch of us were going to end up there. So, uh, uh, yeah, I was pretty certain that's where I was going to end up. What was your MOS? I was uh, infantry. And your rank at this time, private? Or? Uh, when I got to Vietnam, a PFC. So are you gung-ho, ready to go? I mean, tell me about the first time you got to Vietnam in country, what you experienced when you arrived there for the first time. Well, I, some of the things that I distinctly remember are, are the heat, uh, the humidity, and the smell. Uh, a very different type of smell. And uh, the first thing you do is you go to an in-country processing center and you spend about a week there. And uh, uh, for, of course, I, you know, my MOS was infantry, so I, I had been through all that. But if you had an, M, uh, an MOS that was other than infantry, it was a five-day crash course in combat. To me, it wasn't anything new, though. And uh, then you got transferred to your unit. So what was your unit that you were assigned to, the company, battalion? Okay, the first unit that I went to was Alpha Company, 1st uh, of the 508, 3rd Brigade, 82nd Airborne. And they were located down in the Saigon area. Uh, so, in fact, I remember when I, when I found out I was going to an airborne unit, I thought, oh, my lord, airborne unit, you know, wow. Uh, how much worse could it be? <laughs> so, and then I remember when I arrived, uh, we went out on a deuce and a half. And uh, I remember, you know, God, I, I had a death grip on my M16, and I'm looking everywhere. And, and of course, the guys that had been in country for a while, you know, that they, are much more laid back than I am. And, and we pull into this little fire support base, and it's about the size of a football field. And it's got, you know, four or five strands of concertina wire around it, and there's claymores everywhere, and, and, and we get off this uh, deuce and half, and, uh, and uh, a guy hollers over, hey, uh, there, was, there was a USO show going on. And, uh, and the stage was made up of planks on, you know, 55-gallon barrels, and he hollers over, Cherry Boys, you should come over and see this show. And, of course, I was feeling bad enough the way it was anyway, and, and I thought, oh, man, that, that really didn't make me feel any better. So I thought, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to go to our hooch. So a guy says, you know, follow, follow me, and he takes us into a hooch, and, and he happens to ask, he says, is anybody from Iowa? I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> yeah, I'm from Iowa. And he says, well, my other RTO is from Iowa, so you're going to be in my squad. So that's how I ended up in the squad that I that I uh, ended up in. So, Do you feel invincible at this point as a young man? You said you're, you're, you gripped your M16. I mean, do young people feel maybe invincible and then they get a baptism under fire when the bullets start flying? Do you go through anything like that? Or? I felt pretty invincible at the time. And, and like I said, I, I, I went there. Uh, I wanted to see combat. And, and I wanted to get involved in the fight. And... Uh, until it happens, then, then you start to change your mind. You know, but, but I was ready. So do you remember the first engagement you had with the enemy, where you were and what happened? Uh, very much so. Uh, we were, uh, we were uh, it, this, it, this was a big mission, and a kind of a company-sized mission. Uh, and our particular, we, we were, we were uh, just uh, patrolling a, a brushy area. Uh, uh, there's a lot of grass, a lot of, a lot of brush type stuff. And uh, our company broke up into two parts. And one part went with the sergeant and the other part went with the lieutenant. And I was already an RTO then uh, for the lieutenant. And we happened to hear an explosion and one of the guys that was with the other group 
uh, had uh, had uh, uh, set off a booby trap, and uh, so then uh, uh, we kept going about uh, we kept going about uh, uh, our business, and the lieutenant kind of wandered off, and and he just liked to do that. And, and then all of a sudden he, he wandered onto a trail. And uh, of course I had to follow him everywhere he went. And, I, and I, I kept telling him, Lieutenant, I don't think this is a very good idea, us wandering off by ourselves. And, and then we got to this trail and he starts going down the trail. I said, boy, Lieutenant, I think this is really a bad idea. Now you're using the trail. We shouldn't be using the trail. So, but he's just following along the trail and I'm following along with him. And uh, we both stopped at the exact same time and we, we both had spotted a wire going across this trail in front of us and it was about waist high and and so he started proceeds up to it and I thought oh boy this is now a really bad idea <laughs> and he says Stuart you can you can stay back and I said okay so I backed up a little bit and got off the trail but was still watching him you know and, and he walks up to the wire and he starts touching it with his little finger or with his finger just and all of a sudden there's this explosion and and it seemed to me like he flew 10 feet in the air. That's what it seemed like to me. And come to find out the wire was the decoy and he stepped on a mine. And so I go running up there and, and he's literally not bleeding at all. And, uh, but his bare foot, his bare foot is, is there and, and it's not bleeding, it's not tore up. But I look up in the tree and his boot is hanging in the tree and it's tied and it's laced. So it just literally crushed the bones in his foot and, and yanked his boot right off. And, and so then I, I got busy calling in his medevac and, and then the others caught up with us. But uh, uh, that was my first experience of, of seeing buddies wounded. Hmm. Was it, give me a typical day in Vietnam. I mean, you're with the 82nd Airborne, you said? Are you, are you in helicopters being transported into landing areas? Are you on foot or what, what, what's your patrolling uh, consist of? The 82nd's uh, mode of operation was uh, we, would go out to, we would go out to the field and we would, we would spend uh, long periods of time there, weeks, uh, two, three, four weeks at a time. And uh, we literally lived in the field and uh, everything you owned you carried on your back, writing paper, toothpaste, I, I don't care what it was. If, if you're mail from home, if you wanted to save it, you had to hump it. So a lot of times we burn letters after we had memorized them because you just didn't want to have the weight. So uh, some, they'd fly in hot meals occasionally and uh, every two or three weeks they might fly in a change of clothes and that was a luck of the draw of what you might get, you know. And uh, so that was their mode of operation. You would shower in a, near a well or during a, close to a river. Uh, you would spend the day set up in what we would call a day area where you would clean weapons, uh, try to rest, uh, go, all may, go out on small patrols looking for your ambush sites that night. And then night, you would go out and you would set up ambushes. And that's just what you did kind of every day and every day and every day. So. And are you fighting the Viet Cong, the NBA, or, or both? Uh, they're pretty much Viet Cong only. Okay. Okay. And were they, did you know who your enemy was? I hear stories where you didn't know they'd be plowing the field during the day and shooting it at, at night. Did you experience? A absolutely. You would have no idea. No idea whatsoever who the enemy was. What part of Vietnam are you in right now then? We're now down in the southern part of Vietnam. In Vietnam, a lot of people refer to it as the Delta area. It would be below Saigon. Sure. Have you ever been back there? Uh, yes. Yes. Myself and three really good friends of mine, classmates uh, and neighbors, went back in, I believe, 1993. Good experience going back? We had made a pack ahead of time to make it a good experience and uh, had all made a pact to have the right attitude and keep the right attitude and not to lose it. And uh, uh, for the most part, I mean 95%, yes, it was a very good experience. It was, it was helpful to go to a place 
where you had been engaged in a battle uh, to see what it was like now and to help put some closure on it. And amazingly, we were treated very well by the people. Uh, they were anxious to see us. They were anxious to practice their English uh, with us. The only people that weren't receptive to us were uh, people of authority, maybe the policemen or something of a particular small village or something. And I think what bothered them is because we drew so much attention. Uh, but other, uh, overall, it was a very pleasant experience. How much did the helicopters, interaction did you have with helicopters when you're in Vietnam? In the 82nd Airborne, not so much. Uh, uh, there, there we used Chinooks helicopters, which is the troop transport. And they would take us out and drop us off, and then maybe a month later they'd come out and pick us up and maybe move us somewhere else. Uh, the 82nd Airborne went home, though. I was only in that unit about four months, and they were one of the first units to come home and, uh, when Nixon started withdrawing troops. So although the vast majority of people who were in the 82nd Airborne actually didn't come home, they just got assigned to different units. And then there I went to the 25th Infantry Division, and I was around the Tainan and Kuchi areas of Vietnam. And there, literally everywhere you went, was by helicopters. So they got you into a lot of crap and they got you out of a lot of crap. Good way to put it. <laughs> what about any other combat? I mean, you mentioned a few things. Was there a worse time for you as far as the combat or was it sporadic? Did you get any heavy engagements or? Uh, my combat experience was pretty much constant. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many times. There's too many. Small arms fire, artillery? Uh, you name it, both. Uh, in fact, actually a lot of both. Uh, probably the worst particular month I can think of is the month we went into Cambodia, and that was in May of 1970, when we officially went into Cambodia. And uh, we were there just a little bit over four weeks and probably lost a, a good third of our people, either killed or wounded, in that short period of time. Uh, but uh, uh, the demolition people could not blow up the supplies, the ammunition, the caches that we were finding. You know? and, and of course we all knew that because all the, all the enemy had to do was slip across the river into Cambodia and it was a safe haven for them. And they had tons of supplies there. And so uh, it was a very productive month, we thought, but it was a very costly month. Uh, of, of, of any one month, that would be the worst month. But uh, uh, lots of combat, uh, lots of firefights, uh, lots of shelling. Uh, Nui Ba Dinh is in the Tain and Kuchi area of Vietnam. And uh, that area is literally flat all the way around it. And then here's this mountain out of nowhere, just literally out of nowhere. And uh, we owned the top, and we owned the bottom, and they owned everything in between. And uh, this was right after New Year's of 1970. And we went up, they dropped us off at the top, and we were coming down on the side in a mission that was supposed to be two or three days, and I think it was eight or nine days before we finally got off. Uh, we literally got pinned down and, and could not move and uh, we just exchanged fire for them four or five, however many days it was. And the only way we could finally get off is they had to drop CS gas, uh, uh, even on us, and we just literally had to pick ourselves up and, and try to run down as fast as we could to get off. So. You lost friends, wounded or killed over there during your tour? Yes. Were you with them at the time, or just, did you hear about them, or what? Uh, 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 both. Mostly with. Uh, it depends. Uh, your particular squad might not go out. You might be in that particular night, and then they might lose somebody, so you wouldn't be there at the time. But uh, uh, for the most part, uh, with when it happened. Were you able to help them at the time, or the medics do all that, or I mean? Uh, medics are incredible. 
some of my best buddies are medics. Uh, uh, they respond uh, even when a, a lot of the rest of you uh, won't be moving because you're pinned down. Uh, a medic will move uh, to get to a wounded. So uh, I have the utmost respect for them. Uh, they worked on me, uh, worked on buddies. Uh, sometimes if there's a lot of wounded, uh, the medic will give him a shot and say, stay with him, talk to him, do what you can, because i got to move on to somebody else. So there's not a lot you can do for them other than you know, try to comfort them as best you can. So uh, especially if they're going to die, you know. Uh, and you, could, you generally would know who was, going to, who was going to make it and who, wasn't, who was not. So. Do you ever have thoughts about being back home when you're over there, or is it just you're focused on your job? And what got you through the hard times, Stuart? Your training, your faith in God, how did you get through the hard times? Well, I came from an extremely religious family. Uh, strong faith in my background. Uh, we would talk about home when we would be somewhere secure. Well, it was your girlfriends, your friends, what you're going to do when you get back to the world, so on and so on. Uh, I, uh, my family and friends were, were great about writing me, so mail was incredibly helpful. Uh, faith was incredibly helpful, and just your, your closeness to those guys that you were with was incredibly helpful. So the camaraderie was high with you guys? Extremely. How did Vietnam change you as a person? that whole experience? Well, some would say for the worse. Uh, it is definitely a part of who and what I am. And uh, uh, my mother s said once to me, she said, I would like the other Stuart back. And I told her, I says, well, I don't know if you can get all of him back. You know, so this might be the best it's going to be. But uh, yes, it definitely shapes your life and becomes a part of it. Uh, it changes how you look at things. Uh, what might be a crisis to another person, to you, is, is, is no big deal, you know. Get excited about something that's really important, you know, really important uh, and not trivial. Uh, uh, we tend to, um, my best friends tend to be other veterans, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can, you can't go through what combat veterans go through and I think be the same as everybody else. It's, it's just different for you, you know. And, and you have that. I think a constant sense of, of survival guilt, and survival guilt is, is real, and, uh, and uh, I don't think about it as much as I used to, but uh, it crosses, it comes across your mind a lot, every day, so. Obviously, how would you define combat? It's a good question. Well, <laughs> there's all kinds, okay? Uh, shelling, you know, when you, when you're being mortared by the enemy, and the thing about a mortar is, you, you can hear it when it hits the tube, the poop, and then you don't hear anything, but you know it's coming. You just don't know where it's going to land. And so in between that time, when you hear that hit the tube, and where it lands is, is well, it, it seems like hours, it's probably only seconds, but it seems like your whole life seems to pass in front of you. you know, you've got that time to think, you know, well, God, what if it lands right here, you know? Uh, then uh, incoming is a little bit different, uh, incoming from artillery, and that uh, uh, you may not hear it being shot because it could be a long ways away, but as it gets close, you can hear it coming in. And uh, so there again, you hear it and it's like, oh, man, but where's it going to land? You know, could land right on top of me. 
Uh, and then there's small arm fire. Uh, either be from AK-47s or either be from machine guns. It really doesn't make too much difference. Uh, when, when, when bullets start knocking branches and leaves and kicking dirt in front of your face or you see it rippling the body in front of you, uh, that's pretty intense, you know. Uh, and, and what it can do to a human body, you know, the carnage. And, and so, uh, uh, wasn't, s not scared at the time because you're, you're busy reacting and you're trying to, f you're trying to, you're firing back at them too and, uh, and trying to survive and trying to help your buddies and, and so on and so on. I guess while it's happening, you really don't think too much of it because you, you don't have time right then to think about it. It's afterwards when you think, when you can, later, when it's done, right? you, can, you, you can reflect on it. So. Yeah, I've heard it been described as there's no fear in combat. It's afterwards, you, the emotions, the physical, the emotional, just, you, you kind of like, whew, you know, think about what could have happened. Type mm -hmm. of I don't know. How lucky you were. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about the, how would you unwind, I mean, how would you guys, would you just talk to each other after a hard day, or what, what did you guys do to, you know, break the stress or whatever, you know? Uh, a lot of my existence uh, was, was either in the field or in very small fire support bases, so really about the only way to unwind uh, is by talking to one another, uh, maybe playing cards, because uh, there wasn't much to do, really. If you were in a bigger base camp, uh, maybe you could go to the EM club, and you'd probably just get drunk, you know. Uh, marijuana, when I was there, uh, there were people that smoked marijuana. Uh, sometimes Those guys would generally go off by themselves, and that's maybe probably how they uh, wound down, you know. Were you conscious of fighting for God and country at the time, or is it more of a matter of survival? I've always believed in motherhood, apple pie, God and country. I mean, uh, 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 my, grandma, my grandmother was a gold star mother, because uh, my uncle was killed in uh, World War II. My own mother she was actually a gold star mother, even though my brother was killed in training. She was considered a gold star mother. So, I mean, I grew up going to Memorial Day, and my uncle was in World War II, and so, you know, very patriotic. And, and so it was all about motherhood and, and freedom and democracy. And, and, and I firmly believed in that. And I firmly believe that people of the world should be, uh, should be free and they'd be able to make their own choices. So I firmly believed in what we did when I first got there. After a while, uh, we knew we weren't going to lose the war. America wasn't. But we knew by turning it over to the South Vietnamese that they were going to lose the war. We knew that. And we knew that uh, Nixon's, uh, the reason we went into Cambodia was to set, in our opinion, was we had to go in and cl clear out those caches, destroy all this ammunition and stuff, to set the North Vietnamese far enough back that we could pull out with honor and then let South Vietnam lose the war. Uh, we all felt that way. We fought with the South Vietnamese. Uh, not a reflection on all of them, but uh, probably, we're not trained that well. We're not motivated that well. We're probably sick of war from their country have been involved with it for many years. So didn't particularly like going on missions with them, didn't trust them uh, to, to guard our back like our own people. So just didn't have a lot of respect for them as soldiers. What about any other combat over there, Stuart? I mean, just you, you've given me some information as far as you know, who you're fighting, what you're doing on a daily basis. Um, are you carrying an M16 or what are you carrying? Because you mentioned that. When, when, I, when I first got to the 82nd Airborne, because I was a cherry boy, fresh meat, new meat, whatever you want to call it, uh, you had to walk point. And of course, walking point in the jungle, uh, uh, 
no training in basic and AIT to walk point. There is no such thing as training for walking point. You get there because you're the new guy, here's a machete, and have at it. And it is simply by the grace of God that you survive. Uh, if you survive long enough, then you get the skill. Uh, but otherwise, it, it's a matter of luck. Uh, and I was just lucky enough that while I was doing that particular job, I survived. The reason I didn't have to do it very long is uh, the company I first went to, there wasn't a lieutenant at the time that I got there. Uh, and I didn't know why. There, he had either gone home or got wounded or whatever. And a sergeant was running, uh, the sergeant was running the platoon. And we had a guy that was kind of a big goof off. And, and the sergeant, uh, the way, his way of punishing him was to make him be the RTO, radio telephone operator. And because the Prick 25 weighs 25 pounds and you got to carry batteries and it's really kind of a horrible job. And it's like having a walking target on your back, you know. So, and all of a sudden one day, a new lieutenant shows up and we're standing on this mud dirt road and he's got nice shiny boots on and fatigues and the whole works and he's going on down the line and he asks me, he says, what's your name? I says, Simonson, where are you from? I says, I'm from Iowa. And he's poking me in the chest and he's saying, Simonson, you're my new RTO. And I thought, oh shit, that's the punishment job. You know, I don't want that. <laughs> and, but at least it got me out of walking point. But from then, the rest of the time I was in Vietnam, I was an RTO. So. So are you calling in the medevacs when people are wounded or what? You're calling in the med yes, you're calling in the medevacs, you're, uh, you're, you're the communication between the other platoons, you're the communication with the rear area, you're the communication with calling in gunships, artillery, uh, you name it, you're doing it. So who's instructing you or are you doing this all by yourself? The, the, the call, like calling for a medevac, does somebody tell you to do that? Uh, well, you just know to do it when somebody's wounded, so. So when someone's wounded, do you assess the situation? Do you just automatically call in? Do they just call in for one guy, or do they wait until six guys are down? Generally, you, you, you'd call them in for, depends, usually. You're in the middle of a firefight. You're not calling for any medevacs until the firefight is through. Then if you're in a deep jungle, you gotta, you got to find a clearing to be able to bring a medevac in. So, uh, uh, but we would call a medevac in for one person, two people, six people, whatever the case may be. But it might be, who knows how long it might be after, uh, after he was actually wounded before you finally got him put on a medevac. So uh, uh, the medics would tend to him, try to get him as stabilized as he can. If he was dead, you wouldn't necessarily have to call the medevac in as quick. What, do you remember what you would say? Would you, would you go by code names or are you talking to the base or whatever? Oh, yeah. yeah. You, uh, let's say, for example, uh, uh, the lieutenant might be his, his, he might be 26 Alpha, you know, and I didn't have my own name. I'd just say uh, 26 Alpha coin, whatever home base might have been called, you know, and then just over and just the radio jargon that you use and, and, uh, uh, our forward observer, uh, who's, in, who's in charge of Carlin and artillery and stuff like this, uh, uh, well, they'd always know our coordinates. I mean, uh, so, well, we always kept in the breast of our coordinates anyway. And uh, so you, and then you get somebody and you tell them you need a medevac, one, two, or however it may be. Did you ever help load the patients onto the medevacs? Or? Uh, yes, a lot of times, a lot of times. Is that, is that, are these guys stabilized, you said, on the field, or are they... I mean. They're as stabilized as you can get them, you know. Uh, are they on litters or what? Uh, generally not. Uh, if they were really bad, you would take your poncho and you would use that as a litter. Uh, you can take your fatigue shirts and by buttoning, inner buttoning them, you can make uh, a makeshift uh, litter. And, and we've done that before. Uh, being an RTO and being your communication link, you really get involved in a lot of things. So it would be very common for us to go back with a small group to the pickup site for the PZ 
for the uh, medevac to pick up the wounded. So yes, you would help carry him and, and help put him on and, and, and bring, in, bring in the, uh, uh, the medevac. So uh, very common that we would do that. I'm trying to think about the email you initially sent me. I don't have it in front of me. I got it on my computer. I'm wondering if I want to bring it up. Um, there were some things you said to me in there. I don't know if we've covered them yet. Do you remember the email you sent to me the first time? Yes. Do you? Um, let me just... Uh, I want you to give it to me like it is. Your Bronze Star. Tell me the citation, where you were and what you did to get the Bronze Star. Uh, the, the, the Bronze Star was actually uh, of a big overall mission. Uh, not anything in particular that I, that I, that I did in, in, myself. Uh, and uh, it would have been after the uh, uh, mission on the mountain where we got uh, pinned down for like uh, six, seven days. Uh, both my, my lieutenant had gotten wounded, my uh, uh, other RTO had gotten wounded, uh, so that left myself with a new sergeant uh, who had only been in Vietnam a very short period of time, a very short period of time, and was very uh, inexperienced. And uh, so uh, I was the only RTO left in our uh, squad. So for those uh, four or five days, wh whatever it was, uh, I, I would move from place to place to make sure that our guys were okay and then when you moved from place to place, you, you subjected yourself to sniper fire. And so, and that just is what I did for those three or four days and, and, uh, and tried to assist the sergeant as much as he could, being uh, as new to Vietnam as he was. So I, I don't consider it tremendously heroic. It's just what you were expected to do. So, did you do something under fire while your, 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 your friends or your buddies were wounded and without respect for your own safety, you went and drug these guys out of the fire and threw hand grenades and blew up? <laughs> That's no. what those citations sound like. No, no, not, not anything that dramatic. No. Not anything that dramatic. Usually when I ask them, I go read it later and I just freak out. Like, he didn't tell anything like that. So, that's, they, they sound good, so I wanted to make sure you told me everything. Yeah, not, no. Uh, uh, I mean, I was there when both of them got wounded, you know, and naturally would have helped, you know, pull them, pull them to safety. Uh, but uh, uh, under the roar of a machine gun fire or anything like that, no, I, I, I don't consider what I've done it isn't anything that anybody else there wouldn't have done. I just happened to be there when it happened. You know, and probably the why they got picked off is because the snipers know who to shoot. You know, obviously they knew generally the guy either in front of or behind the RTO is going to be a lieutenant, a sergeant, a somebody of leadership. So uh, it, it's, uh, they just happened to get it right the very first shot on him, and, and then uh, they just happened to get the RTO. Them, you know, so. Uh, uh, obviously, two very you know key people when it comes to communication and, and leadership. So I just happened to be there when it happened. Okay. How about your Purple Heart? Were you wounded? Uh, yes. Uh, Tell me what happened, where you were. And... The Purple Heart happened the very first day into Cambodia, and uh, uh, we knew a big mission was up but we didn't know what. And myself being, then I was the company commander's RTO. So, and we worked in what was called the, the CP, the command post, which consisted of only about eight of us. And so we generally were in the know, but we still, we didn't even have a clue, but we knew something huge was up because they were taking everybody they could and putting them back online. And, and one, of the, one of the things that really told me something big was up, they ordered us all to go to church. They ordered us. And they had flown in priests, ministers, and that was very unusual. Usually if you wanted to go to church, it was the luck of the draw who was there doing it. And we didn't care. You know, didn't care who was giving the service. If you wanted to go to church, you went. But they had, uh, uh, so I thought, boy, this is really unusual. And they ordered everybody to write a letter home. And that was very unusual. And I had to go around and help pick them up. And I thought, 
something big is up. And then early one morning, we get up and we go out to, uh, we, were, we were in, I think, Tain Inn then, and uh, go out to the helicopter pad and just helicopter after helicopter after helicopter is coming in to pick us up. And didn't know where we were going until we hit the ground. And that's when, well, we're in Cambodia. So uh, our mission, they landed us inside. Our mission was then to patrol the area back to the river so that they could build a bridge, a pontoon type bridge. And so we get to the edge of the bridge and they were supposed to have already prepped the area with artillery. And either something happened or the Vietnamese got on our radar line, but they actually called the artillery in on top of us. And uh, uh, the first rounds landed on the other side of the river and we didn't think too much about that because of all thought, well, they're supposed to prep the area. We thought they were prepping the other side of the river. And then the second rounds landed right in the middle of the river. And then we start to really get nervous, like, ooh, this doesn't look very good. And uh, I happened to be right on the edge of the river, on the other side, and the third rounds landed right there. And, and uh, so I got wounded right off the very bat, right here. And uh, uh, it was pretty much mass confusion. And then all of a sudden the com company commander just uh, gave the order that it was everybody for himself to try to outrun it. And uh, so a, a, a really good buddy of mine uh, was, was trying to bandage me up and, uh, and, uh, and wouldn't leave me. And I was a little bit of a daze, you know, I mean, uh, but I, I was able to move. And so we're, we're starting to low crawl uh, and uh, to try to find some, some type of cover. And uh, they are now, the, now the artillery rounds are just sporadic. They're everywhere, you know. And uh, uh, there was this explosion. And I remember the force. It, it's like slammed me to the ground. Slammed me to the ground. And there again, it seemed like a long time. It was probably only seconds. And uh, when I opened my eyes, I mean, dust and... I could taste the sulfur on my lips. Uh, and uh, another buddy of mine was right in front of me, and, and, and I looked at him, and you okay? And he's okay. And, and then I looked to the side of me, and uh, there was a very good friend of ours, and uh, uh, half of his back had been blown away. And, uh, but he was, still trying to, he was still trying to crawl. And I remember seeing his face and just, just the glaze on his face. And, and I said, well, Bob, there's nothing we can do for him. And, and then, so then I turned around to see how Bruce is doing because he's the guy that was helping me. And uh, when I turned around to see him, uh, all, all, I couldn't see anything but blood and flesh. And uh, I, thought that, uh, I thought that his head had been blown off is what I thought time. Uh, and uh, I said to Bobby, I said, there's, uh, there's nothing we can do for Bruce either. Uh, we need to keep moving. And uh, so we did. And we came across a uh, huge anthill. And then we, we, st we stayed behind it because that was, I mean, huge being, I mean, it was four feet tall and, you know, six feet wide at the base. And, and uh, we rode the shelling out there. And uh, so then I, I got dusted off and, and so on and so on. But uh, uh, Bruce probably would have been alive had he not stayed to help me if he had taken off when everybody else did. Uh, but he wouldn't leave a wounded buddy, you know. So my wounds was really quite minor. Uh, 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 and there was only two people killed that day, those two people that happened to be right there. And uh, uh, Bobby, who was my other buddy, we never talked about that the rest of the time we were in Vietnam. We, we never brought the issue up. And we saw each other about uh, 20 years later. And we got talking about that day. And uh, I, said, uh, I said, Bobby, what happened to Bruce? And uh, because, you know, he was there afterwards and, and uh, of course the dead, uh, the dead went last and so I, I was already gone and, and he didn't get his head blown off the way I thought but it had uh, 
That shell must have lasted, landed incredibly close to him and the other guy over here. And, and, and it pretty much blew him in half. Uh, but, it, but it took his flesh from his back and it threw over the top of his head. So that when I turned around, all I could see was blood and flesh, and I couldn't see his head. And, uh, but when they, when they went to move him, he literally tore in half. That, that's how severed he was. So uh, earlier when he asked, maybe that was probably the worst yeah. day. <laughs> that was probably the worst day. Well, when you came home from Vietnam, did you just put all that in a closet and forget about it? or? Uh, yes. Uh, I was a little wild when I first got home, you know, probably drank a little too much. Uh, but I worked hard. I mean, I, I always worked, uh, uh, was, you know, financially responsible, socially responsible. Uh, then met my wife and, and, and got married and started having children and went to college. And I guess I was just busy supporting myself, my wife and my children and, and didn't think didn't really think too much about it. Uh, what about the transition from combat back to civilian life? Was that difficult for you? Well, it's amazing how uh, in Vietnam, uh, and it could be the same for Iraq too, uh, uh, in Vietnam you could literally be in the field one day and two and a half to three days later you could be on, you could be on Main Street of your hometown. And it's like, have a nice life and uh, uh, do the best you can to deal with it. And for me, and I think for a lot of guys, some guys struggled right off the very beginning. I think because I got so busy doing other things, uh, I'd probably have to honestly say I didn't think about Vietnam for 20 years. I was active in the Legion and veterans organizations, but really, th really, think a lot about it and, and then all of a sudden maybe it's because my plate was becoming emptier and maybe that gave room for it but it then it the, when it started coming to the surface it just kept coming and coming. I couldn't stop it. How about coming home was there any sort of homecoming or do you, I've heard some horror stories about coming home what was your experience like? Well uh, I flew home at night, so I mean, I you know went through California, so I mean, I, I didn't have anybody you know spitting on me or anything of that nature, and and Whittemore, uh, Iowa, rural Iowa, Whittemore, Kasuth County, is very veteran supportive, very veteran supportive, a lot of veterans, and so I had a wonderful homecoming. Uh, parents threw a big party. Uh, first time I go to town, you know, people coming up, shaking my hand, thanking me, wanting to buy me a beer, so on and so on. So, no, my reception, what it was as good as you could want for a reception. That's good to hear. Tell me about the Vietnam Wall. You ever been out there? Yes. Tell me the first time you went, why you went, and how you felt. Uh, the first time I went was with... Uh, my, my company in the 25th has a reunion every other year, just for our company. And they had it in Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, so I had tracked down two of my other RTO buddies. And, and we were very, very close. It's kind of like we were connected at the hip. If I saw it, they saw it. Because I was there, they were there. And uh, my one particular buddy, I called in his dust off the day he got wounded. And, and he was there when I got wounded and helped call in mine. And uh, so we, had, we made arrangements to all go to this reunion because we wanted to go to the wall together. And uh, so uh, we had, uh, uh, our company kind of had a private ceremony off to the side. And when we talked, and then we all went down as a group. And so it was, uh, it was very emotional, and it was very moving, very touching. And there aren't two other people that I, you know, those were the two people I wanted to be with when I went to the wall. So. Yeah. 
Stuart, what does freedom mean to you? As a veteran, as an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you, and what, how do you feel about that? I love freedom. And uh, uh, I think America is the best place in the world. Faults, God knows we got plenty. But uh, having been to other places, I'll take America any day. Uh, we should not take it for granted. We do. We shouldn't. Uh, it's incredible that I could get in my car and I could drive any direction uh, within the borders of this country, not be stopped, not be hassled as long as I'm obeying the laws, go anywhere, do anything. Uh, only your, uh, only your economic limitations could, can limit you from what you want to do. Uh, that's incredible. I can say what I want, do what I want, read what I want. It's fantastic. So, uh, and, and I don't think we appreciate it enough. Uh, and those that don't think, go live somewhere else and see what it's like. And I think you'll want to come back here, you know. So, uh, I cherish it and, and appreciate it and don't take it for granted. Tell me about the price for freedom, to defend our freedoms. What would you tell a young person today who is born in a free country, doesn't even give it a second thought, having never not been free? What would you tell a young person about the price or the cost for freedom? I, I encourage people to, Memorial Day is not just a day to me. It's not a long weekend to me. It's not, yeah, I don't go fishing, I don't go camping, I don't. Memorial Day is for that purpose, to, to remember those sacrifices, because that's what has gotten you that freedom, you know. It's great that he can take it for granted. That's fine. But I think he, he, he needs to know the cost, you know, and he needs to know the sacrifices, because that's what it's about sacrifices by, they might even have relatives that have made that sacrifice. Ordinary men and women, no braver, stronger than anybody else, left their homes, faraway lands, and did what they were asked to do, okay, uh, for that precious gift. They need to understand that, you know. They need to appreciate that. And, uh, and, uh, they need to go to a Memorial Day service <laughs> and a Veterans Day service uh, or, go, or, go, or, or go to the wall or go to a Veterans Cemetery and, and think, you know, uh, uh, what these people did uh, for him to have that precious gift. So. That's good. I agree. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? I, I'm all about red, white, and blue. And uh, believe it or not, uh, I am opposed to a constitutional uh, amendment to ban burning of the flag uh, in protest. Uh, I'm, I love freedom so much. How can you be any more free than to burn the flag of your country in protest of something? They're never going to burn mine, and I'd never burn one. But I don't have a problem with somebody burning one in protest. That is truly freedom, in my opinion. Now, that's not shared by a lot of veterans, I'm sure. But that's, that, that's how I feel about it. But I am red, white, and blue. I fly the flag. I sell flagpoles. I erect them. I, I'll do whatever I can uh, to promote the flag. Are you proud to be a Vietnam veteran? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, uh, I wish the outcome had been different, although uh, Viet the Vietnam veteran himself has nothing to hang his head about. No major battle ever, no major battle ever in Vietnam was lost by uh, the American soldier, none whatsoever. Uh, the war was not lost by America. The war was lost by the South Vietnamese and by politics. So the Vietnam soldier has nothing to, uh, nothing to be ashamed of. He fought uh, brilliantly and honorably, uh, the same way uh, our veterans have from all the other wars. So, uh, no, I'm very proud to have served. Good. Um, obviously, people have thanked you for your service. How does that make you feel? Uh, 
don't need to, <laughs> but it's nice. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, when I see veterans now, Iraqi veterans, I like to go up. Uh, when I see anybody in uniform, I like to go over and thank them for their service, uh, thank, thank them uh, for what they're doing. It seems like America has gotten it, that there is a difference between war and the soldier. And I think they really got it. You can hate the war, but, and, but you absolutely have to respect the soldier. And it seems like America is doing that, and that's fantastic. A couple more questions. What should our country remember about Vietnam? <laughs> well, I think there's some historic things to remember, uh, to learn from there, some political things. Uh, I think what, uh, what I would like them to, re them to remember is that the American soldier went over there and fought for an, an ideal. That people should be able to live free, make their own choices under a free government. And that's definitely the way I felt when I went over there. And I was willing to do that. Uh, it, it seems like American GIs have always been willing to die for somebody else's freedom. Probably because they understand it and appreciate it and enjoy it you know, enjoy their own and then think that you know, that's the way the world should be. So uh, I guess uh, I would want history to remember that uh, these guys were willing to do that same thing, and they did. One more question. What should our country remember or know about the Vietnam veteran yesterday and today? Uh, they really they really don't want to be treated differently than anybody else. Uh, uh, they want to be just like everybody else, part of the mainstream, you know. Uh, sometimes maybe their own actions cause them to be treated a little, little bit differently. Uh, I never felt that way. Uh, 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 I guess appreciate it for just what we did, and it doesn't need to go any further than that, and, and then not treat it any differently uh, than, than anybody else that you know. So, uh, because for the most part, uh, the vast majority of, uh, of us aren't any different, other than our experience is the only thing that makes us different, so. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. I've asked all the veterans, almost 500 of them now, five years, so you're, you're, in a, you're an elite group here, but at the end of my interview, I, I asked them to give me a salute into the camera. Can you do that for me when I ask you from where you're seated? Sure. Okay. If you see one of my films, you'll understand this is done very gracefully. So. Okay. All right. Let me just back my camera off of here. Right into the camera, Stu. Go ahead. Thank you.